From the banks of Dewey Lake, it's the Dewey Pod Monster. Welcome back. My name is John, and this is the Dewey Pod Monster Podcast. This is your weekly podcast about consumption. We are proud members of the You Run Podcast Network. You can check out all of our previous episodes, as well as all the other wonderful podcasts on the You Run Podcast Network at yourunpodcast.com. With me this week is the host of some podcasts, this podcast, Dewey Pod Monster Podcast. His name is Sean. Sean, how are you doing today? Are you recovering from Cinco de Mayo, Kentucky Derby, and whatever other shenanigans you got into this past weekend? God damn! <laughs> <laughs> was that me or was that something else? No, that was you. Well, that's good. John, I, I want to talk about that, but I want to talk, can we start a little bit different this week? We do whatever you want. This is a podcast about consumption. So what I did this past weekend was my birthday. And I decided, well, last week was happy boy to birthday. Thank you very much. You didn't have to say that. I wasn't saying that for whatever, but I got a bunch of cards like from for for liquor and stuff. So this is my first bottle of bourbon. Mm -hmm. And I want I got you, one back there. Do you want me to go get it and open it up with you? Is it unopened? Yours is unopened, too. Uh, Maybe. I don't know. I have that over there. Do you want me to go? Grab yeah, let's one? do it together. Let's do a little taste. All right. So I'll just van you watch me wander through. The yeah. OK. Yeah, Sounds go good. Ahead and talk. I'm, I'm going to get <laughs> So I'm obviously a big beer drinker. I drink beer and I've drank burble, burble, bourbon barrel aged beer before, but I'm not a Love bourbon it. guy. Burble, not a burble guy, not a bourbon guy. So I decided, you know, maybe now that I'm a year older and wiser, we'll start on the bourbon train. So you can't see this because this is an audio podcast, but I've got uh, Maker's Mark Kentucky Straight Bourbon Whiskey. Yeah. Also oh, unopened. Look at that. These, so th this, if you're not familiar with Maker's Mark, these are the ones that have the wax across the top. And John's is sealed as well. This is my first like big foray. I don't even know if I've ever poured bourbon before. Do you do yours straight? Do you do it with water? Do you put ice in it? How do you do yours? Um, oh, they changed it. It's not a cork anymore. It's a twist stop now. Oh, bastard. I prefer it straight generally. Damn, how much are you pouring there? It's about a finger and a half. Really? It's a neck pour. I will tell you this, since you're opening this and this is your first time, this bottle would yeah. taste better. Like after you pour this and give it like a week to kind of air out, do its thing in the bottle. Yeah, it will be better than a neck pour. But I prefer it straight generally. But I I think I've said this on the show before, and I, I find it interesting that you got Maker's Mark because I think that's where I said to start before, too. I listen. Well, my wife would say otherwise, but how much should I pour here? Uh, about an ounce to two ounces. Two ounces is what you would get in a bar if you were to pour that, roughly. Well, so good. That's more than enough, I'm sure. This? So, yeah, that's good. Okay. So, All right. Do I let it sit and breathe, or what do I do here? I would give it a second. Okay. What I say for people that are... So, we'll see how you do with this, because Maker's Mark is a pretty approachable bourbon. Like, it's not... It shouldn't, like, beat the shit out of you or anything, throw you around the room or do anything like that. <laughs> we can get to that later. But <laughs> the difference between beer... And whiskey is our friend. Alcohol is far more present. Yes. It. And it can take some time for your palate to adjust to that. Not just the flavors in it, but the heat and well, alcohol that's in it. So if this Are you telling me there's your, alcohol in here, I am. Oh, shit. If it's something that's like a little abrasive to start with, and I'm not saying this is like you pussy or anything like that. I, I don't I don't believe that to be the, the case if it's too abrasive or just not enjoyable to begin with add an ice cube pour it all add a couple drops of water well, no <laughs> i also think cocktails are a really easy way to start getting into bourbon but the trick with that is you got to find the right bar or bartender that knows how to make a cocktail that highlights the spirit and not just covers it in the shit sugar makes everything taste good like if it's just sugar with some booze in it that's not really achieving anything right all right but so what do we this do hasn't here? been a couple minutes so we're just gonna have a quick cheers and do i do i happy gulp birthday. it do i take a sip i would not recommend gulping it it's, okay unless you want to get loopy by the end of this oh well maybe happy birthday to the goddamn host of the dewey pod monster podcast god damn it i'm gonna have to get you the right glassware yes because it took like <laughs> i keep tipping this glass back it's kind of like a tulip but without the stem or um yeah whatever and it just yeah. kept going and didn't get it took forever to get something so yeah how's that feel <laughs> tastes like burning yeah see for me like with 
makers in particular, I get a lot of cherry off of it. It's like a cherry with like a brown sugar back on it. Yeah. It is warmer. I've been told by my wife who keeps trying whiskey, even though she hates it every time she tries it. I'm like, you know, you don't have to like that. She goes, you like it. I'm going to keep trying. I'm like, okay. God damn it. Right. This one's, I think it's a really good cocktail whiskey for that. Like it's my go-to if i'm in a bar and i'm ordering an old-fashioned and they ask me what i want unless i'm in like a fancy whiskey bar where i can have pretty much whatever i want this is usually my go-to answer because almost every bar in the country has it Mm -hmm. it's affordable and it plays well with the flavors that should be in an old-fashioned so it's it's one that i uh i consume a good amount of maker's mark and there's i think five or six other maker's mark bottles of different varieties back there so i can tell you i get a sweet but I don't quite know what sweet that is. And like, um, mm. I don't know when I would drink like barrel aged beer, you get like that barrel kind of characteristic. I kind of feel like I get that too on the finish and sure. it, you know, as it kind of breathes a little bit. I will say for me, like to really start picking out major flavors, like flavor profiles in whiskey, it took probably six to 12 months to really get to that point. If you're going to go down that road, start small like start with bottles like this and try to don't don't do what we did with beer like wait till you get a little more like into what you like work through the bottles that you have and try to pick out stuff on that just because too much at once like if you want to do that if you just want to try a bunch of crazy shit come over here i have plenty of bourbon i will be more than glad to pour you as much as you want and drive your ass home maybe that's a live stream if you want to hear a live stream of that let us know and it's summer coming up so should be pretty manageable. Yeah, well, I mean, we'd be drinking in the basement, so at least whiskey in summer is not usually the best combination because it's very uh, I just warm, meant the extended you know? hours. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> not so much the locale. Basements are good for that, though. All right, so on to on with the show. Thanks for indulging me. And everybody listening, oh, thanks for indulging me. more than glad me. to indulge. What have you been watching this week, Sean? Have you watched anything? Or did you just been drinking bourbon and, you know, getting in fights at Mexican restaurants? Just guzzling, guzzling bourbon. That's it. I got a chance to watch a few things, not not a whole lot, you know, kind of the same tried and true, obviously watch Dark Side of the Ring this episode. The newest episode as the time of this recording was Sandman. He's an ECW staple, the hardcore, hardcoreist of the hardcore. He, I didn't really know much about him until he got to WWE, or maybe he's in WCW. Actually, I don't remember which one he was in, but I, I didn't really follow or catch him until then and they didn't really use him very well his nickname like his real life him as a person his nickname is hack h-a-k and that's what yeah that's appropriate right that's what his brother called him at seven or something five or seven when he was five or seven is that a bible name i don't think so hack christ he uh um, jesus's less skilled carpenter brother hack there you go hey that'd be that'd be pretty cool he cuts down the trees but that's about all he does he's a lumberjack yeah he he wrestled his hack when he wrestled for whatever mainstream promotion, but that was a pretty interesting episode. Won't really go into it. If you want to watch it, obviously we'll link it in the show notes or to dark side of the ring as a, as a whole thing. I think it actually does show up on YouTube. So maybe I'll find the specific episodes and start linking those next up. I watched a documentary. I'm not going to go too into it because I honestly don't know what I actually watched. It's called bitter Lake and it is an Adam Curtis documentary. Adam Curtis is a British like BBC documentarian and his style of documentary editing and filmmaking is really dreamlike. It it attempts to tell the story of how the conflict in Afghanistan and the Middle East is really linked to like the 50s. And in the 50s, Afghanistan, they were kind of a third world country and they well, they still are, but they wanted to update, modernize themselves. They wanted to modernize themselves and they wanted to follow FDR's plan. So they had FDR come and they they met on Bitter Lake. And then it kind of goes through and tries to tell how the U.S. and the U.K. made politics. This is very deep. They <laughs> made politics more about good versus evil than about shades of gray and, you know, stuff like that. Hmm. I, that's pretty much all I'm going to say about it because I watched the full thing and I'm like, huh? You can watch it on YouTube. I watch it on BBC via VPN. All his stuff is on BBC if you VPN in through the UK or whatever. All that stuff's free on there. Next up, I watched a Hulu documentary that just came out. It's called The Contestant, and it is about a Japanese game show. Did you hear about this? I didn't watch it, but it's been uh, telling me to watch it on Hulu, and I'm moderately interested, but I haven't had the uh, 
attention span for it yet. The elevator pitch is it's a game show. What is it called? What is that shit called? Reality TV game show kind of hybrid where this guy volunteers and gets picked to live in this apartment by himself. No clothes. All he has, he has no food. All he has is are these postcards and magazines. And at the time in Japan, like around late 90s, early 2000s, there was a thing in a lot of Japanese publications where you could send in postcards and they would pick people randomly to win this different stuff. And his goal or the goal of this show for him is to survive off only the winnings that he gets from these magazines. So they don't and they don't tell him that he's they they he has a camera in the apartment, but they don't tell him that they're filming it for air. They just basically tell him, hey, you know, we're filming you, but we're not going to air this. And that's the thing just came out. So it's it's interesting. It takes a, a bit of a turn towards the end, but it kind of goes through his whole his whole journey, so to speak. And then uh, lastly, but not leastly, I watched for a guest spot that I'm going to be doing on a podcast in the woods. We're going to be talking about Slumber Party Massacre. So I I won't go too much into that because I'll save it for their show. So if you want to hear my thoughts on Slumber Party Massacre, go listen to Boomer and Gabby over on their show, which I don't know when that'll be released. We haven't recorded it yet. It's one of those movies that I started watching and I'm like, I've never seen this. And then I started watching it and I'm like, oh, that looks really familiar. Like the first scene where they open the van door and they pull the line worker, the female telephone woman. They like pull her. He pulls her into the van. I'm like, okay, that looks familiar. And then as I watched it more, I'm like, it took about, I don't know, it's an hour and 15, 16 minutes. And it probably took 45 minutes to realize that I'd already seen this movie before. So yeah, that's what, that's what I've been watching. What have you been stroking your whatever with? (laughs) Well, (laughs) mostly my hands, but we talked about the movie Hard to Die a few months back. And one of my favorite parts about that movie is that there's a solid like 10 minute break where they just replay a big chunk of slumber party massacre i'm like i love when movies do that when they're like eh, we got 10 minutes to kill let's just play another movie i will find it and post it in the show notes as well but there was an interview that i read that a website did with jim winorski and they kind of go through how hard to kill and or is it hard to die hard to die right hard to die slumber party massacre and cheerleader massacre no it's another sorority house one there's three of them that are like loosely connected they he talks about it in the in the interview so i'll link it so what have i watched i started the week with a little bit of a short film double feature which is a good way to spend a solid like hour because they're both about an hour and a half 20 minutes or so they're about 35 40 minutes each but our our friends over at amp film on their youtube channel put their first short film on there if you're not aware a bunch of their stuff got taken down because youtube's a bunch of dickholes and they've been kind of slowly re-uploading stuff so when this came back up i what i i enjoyed it so it's got nino and kent who you would know from murder size and slasher at party so and possibly other ventures In this really weird little like noir, I don't want to call it like a gangster film because it's not that, but it's this weird like crime dynamic. And I'm trying not to ruin this like short story because it's not like it's 30 minute movie. Like you can only put so much in there. Right. But it's something different. And it it does. I like seeing filmmakers like that. You can kind of watch their evolution and how they like kind of flush out what they can do better and better as they do that. And this is early for them. So the as they've progressed like even from that to you know their most recent film murder size you can see a real progression with how they do lighting how they do camera work all that type of stuff obviously technology probably has something to do with that too but that was pretty uh fun and entertaining so that's worth well worth 30 35 minutes of your time i followed that up with a movie that our friend jordana over at pretty killer podcast has recommended several times i think she even recommended it on our show maybe it was on a live stream but it's the the short film blood gorge do you remember talking about this so yeah i don't remember if she mentioned it on the show or i watched one of her instagram lives and she may have talked about it then so yeah i heard about it from her i just don't remember where exactly we heard about it well it's i mean again it's on youtube for free now it's a very quick 40 minute fairly well done slasher film and like is this like are you talking about like halloween quality effects no but it's pretty good for what i imagine is a pretty minimal budget so it's got much everything you want out of this kind of movie so that is fun and goofy and i kind of hope it gets the full-on movie treatment whether they take this idea and spin it into like a full-length 
slasher movie that's just something else or evil dead it and kind of retcon it into like a full length whatever i don't care i'm i'm up for more of it they got a new movie coming out soon too which i think is just called cruel which also i have no idea what the movie's about but the poster looks really rad so i'm already sold the marketing worked uh, you know what i <laughs> i'm more interested in your poster than your trailer most of the time like if you can sell me on the poster that's all i really want your trailer's probably i'm not gonna watch it so unless we decide to react to one or something. So I went on a little Nick Cage trip after that because you got to do that sometimes and watch his movie Primal, which is not great. I don't know if you've seen that one or not. No. He's basically bootlegging like a tiger or some shit or jaguar or something. He captures a jaguar. He's moving it across the country on a boat and some fuckers that are like you know terrorists or bad guys or whatever show up and basically the rest of the movie is animals kill everyone on the boat plus nick cage is the hero sort of it's about what you it's con air <laughs> on a boat but with a with animals blank really stairs all is. around yeah it's <laughs> i mean it's still got nick cage in it but it's i think the way i worded it best i i said uh yeah it's got nick cage but it's like nick cage at like three and a half i need nick cage to be at like six or above preferably it's fine it's you know typical late 2000s action movie okay whatever do you get into the speaking of bourbon do you get into the kentucky derby at all i don't care about it i mean that's probably putting it lightly sure but like my in-laws they have they had a little party my sister-in-law had a little party we all came over and watched the fastest minute on earth or whatever it's called and then went back to drinking fastest two minutes on earth yeah, yeah. I actually find it to be a pretty fun race. It's kind of on the bucket list of things that I'd like to do. I don't think I'd want to pay to go down there because I know it's just insanely expensive. But there's something about all the pomp and circumstance of everything that goes on around the event that it it's, I don't know, I like watching it from afar, I guess. Outside of that, I did find time yesterday to choke down the movie Unfrosted, the new Pop-Tart movie with that Seinfeld directed and stars in. I'm going to go ahead and say it's not great. In fact, there's a lot of like, without trying to sound like a total dick, I hate Amy Schumer. Like she's just one of the least funny people in the world. And I don't know how she keeps getting roles in comedy. She wants to be like a blood sack or something that gets like, you know, lopped off in a movie. Sure. As long as it's quick and to the point. A blood sack. <laughs> yeah. Something like that. That's what I aspire to be. Blood sack. Blood sack number two. She's basically just an unfunny blood sack in this movie. So the only th real redeeming points in this movie is there's a really good line about the proper, the, the politically correct term for hobos, which is not hobos. They prefer to be called bums, which is delivered really well by Jim Gaffigan. And, it, and I would absolutely gladly pay money to see a full length film of Bill Burr portraying JFK, because that is, it's a very short part of the movie, but that is by far the reason to watch this movie if nothing else Bober playing jfk is it's gonna make you laugh because it's <laughs> so like wrong and dead on at the same like the the impression is right on but the words that he's saying in the impression are are not <laughs> and it just it works but past that like it's i don't really know what to compare it to because there's nothing good to compare it feels like a saturday night live sketch that no one had the balls to cut because seinfeld wrote it but an hour and a half long maybe longer than that you know do with that what you will. It's not high on my recommendation list. Yeah, I watched the trailer on Netflix and that convinced me that this is not something I need to see. I mean, you know, I'm a big Seinfeld fan and I know you are too, but right. like that, that's pretty much how I decided I was going to watch it. I was like, well, it's got Seinfeld in it. I mean, how bad can it be? Is, you know, famous <laughs> last words. And I you guess. found out, you fucked around and found out. Well, again, Bober saved a little bit of it as he tends to do. Then the only other thing I really fell into, and this kind of goes on the consumption side of it, since we're not just talking about movies, apparently, um, the band Me First and the Gimme Gimme has released a cover of an Olivia Rodrigo track, which is very poppy, very much so. The original is not by my demographic. I'm not an Olivia Rodrigo fan. I had a feeling you might be more familiar with her than I am just because you have you know, kids. And I got to say, there was like a period where I probably played this track like over the course of the weekend about 10 or 12 times just because I was like, yeah, this kind of has like all the like fun and poppiness of a band like Paramore and Olivia Rodrigo mixed with the like blatant alcoholism of a band like Me First and the Gimme Gimme that are playing it. <laughs> and I don't know why, but it's working for me. So that's available now. That's free on like any. Well, yeah, you can hear it on YouTube. You can hear it on 
Spotify, Apple, all the usual spots where you get music. It's it's available now. So definitely worth checking out. What's the song? It's called Good For You. Oh, okay. Or yeah. that's the title. I am familiar. Ah, yeah. See? It's, again, you're hearing a bunch of middle-aged, like, punk rock, like, lounge acts sing about being dumped by a guy, I think. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. I'm pretty sure that's what it's about. Essentially. Yeah. I mean, it's pop music. I imagine that's what 90% of it is about. So with that, we're going to take a quick break and come back and talk about something that is also good for you or more on topic, I guess, based off what you probably clicked on to listen to us talk about. So we'll be back in just a minute. Hey guys, I just want to take a second to tell you about fellow You Run Podcast network members, the Horror Friendly Podcast. This podcast explores the horror genre one film at a time with one novice panel member and two enthusiasts. Join the Horror Friendly Podcast this month as they welcome in guests and as they celebrate a special birthday episode. So head on over to yourunpodcast.com where you can find all the previous and new Horror Friendly Podcast episodes as well as all the other great You Run Podcast Network members. What the fuck indeed, and we are back. This has to be the most debated episode between the two hosts of this show, because a couple weeks back, we we put some movies up in polls, trying to see what, what you might want us to talk about. We didn't really tell you that's what we were polling as you know, potential episodes, but we had a choice between Django Unchained and Shawshank Redemption. And Shawshank Redemption won by a pretty decent margin. And we put it off a week because we talked about Terminator last week. And then we were going to, I think we went into this week, like, let's just get Shawshank over with. And no more than like, by the time we were done with that sentence, we were like, I don't want to talk about this. And Sean, the person who picked that movie for the poll also said, I don't want to talk about this. So we eventually agreed to not talk about that and started by saying we were going to talk about this weird movie that has a very um, crummy movie march s type score on whatever and then friday thursday friday something like that a couple days ago sean goes how about we talk about godzilla minus one instead i said thank you yes please let's <laughs> talk about that so, there was not much debate yeah no i was a pretty easy sell on godzilla minus one if you are one of the people that voted on shawshank redemption whoever you might be we've we've come to the agreement that if you want us to do a full episode of the show you need to have a formal request to us however you choose to do that listen to the end of this episode we'll tell you where you can send those requests if you want to have us talk to a whole episode we're going to need a little more encouragement than just a poll that we didn't really emphasize what we were doing with the poll there and just to mention you can go on cramp.town we do have a form right on the site and you can put your info in there and just let us know. We just want you to explicitly ask for it. I think we're kind of not quite sure the interest level on a Shawshank Redemption episode. And I don't quite know if love the movie. I love the movie, but I, it's just one of those things you don't really want to talk about. So Godzilla minus one it is. Yeah. Godzilla minus one. This is a different choice. This is not a prison movie. Yeah. Yeah. We start with third party reviews about movies that are not about prison. And this one comes from Max K. and Max. Kind of sounds like a dick. Max says, this movie is trash. Human characters are stupid. Plot is same as other movies that have same plot. Great sense right there. <laughs> VFX effects. Why are you... VFX effects are actually good, and Godzilla was the only good part. It's a waste of time. Negative one out of ten. Half a star out of five. That seems like how movies are talked about. Ranked. Rated. In fairness, the line... Plot is same as other movies with the same <laughs> plot. I like that. I, that's very clever. Right. And then visual effects. So v, v, VFX, I'm assuming you use visual effects. So VFX effects, you're, you're using too many. Effects. Like, again, Max, thank you for your contribution to the show. You sound like a dick and a fucking moron. Sean, what's this movie about? All right. So we head over to IMDb where we read about the storyline and the plot. But first we talk about the popularity. The popularity of this movie is 19. Way up there. Out of some, yeah, it's, it's out of some number. It's up 91 spots from whenever the last time there was a spot. It's got an uh, IMDb. It's got a. Uh, it's got an IMDb rating of 8.1. And again, storyline plot. We start with the. I guess it's the plot. It says post-war Japan is at its lowest point when a new crisis emerges in the form of a giant monster baptized in the horrific power of the atomic bomb. And if we scroll on down to the storyline, it's a little bit more elaborate. It says, 
feeling as if he's unfairly cheated death too many times. Shikishima. This is, so, yeah. spoilers, this is going to be an episode where we don't read a lot of names because it's just going to create a problem. Shikishima, a surviving kamikaze pilot, is attacked on Odo Island along with many warplane engineers by a gargantuan monster. After the engineers die due to... Sh- Due to shit. <laughs> yeah. Shikishima falling... T- yeah, shit. To Shikishima failing to distract the monster, an overwhelming amount of guilt weighs on him, especially after a homeless woman and a baby move into his home when he returns. Shikishima, now on a personal mission, teams up with a large group of veterans to take down the monster known as Godzilla. So while we're breaking down sins, especially after a homeless woman and a baby move into his home, good statement right there. Yeah. Do you know why this jumped up 91 spots since whenever? Because was there something that I missed about this that happened recently or? Well, spoiler alert. (laughs) This is a spoiler full, probably late, and we're not going to get super deep into everything, but just kind of throw it out there. Spoiler alert. This movie did come out in 2023, but Toho owns the rights, like the exclusive rights to Godzilla worldwide. And the reason we didn't talk about this earlier and we wanted to is that they the way that Toho deals with like home release, it wasn't available in America or basically outside of Japan and theaters. It wasn't home, available for home streaming until like last week. So I think with it just being released in, in you know, streaming capacity, that's why it's jumped up so many because now people are like, oh, I heard a lot of really great things about the movie and and. That's, you know, a reason that kind of built a little bit of hype for you and I, I'm sure. But just now hitting home streaming, I mean, the movie came out December 1st last year. It's a bit of a extended time frame to what we usually see for from theater to streaming, I think. OK, that makes sense. Do you have a uh, history with Godzilla? Like, are you a fan or is this a franchise that you're lukewarm on? Like, I feel like most people in our age bracket have one of two stories, either one that's similar to mine, which is. Dad found a bunch of VHSs. Here you go. Shut up. Leave me alone. I'm watching football. Or I just never got into it. I've seen a few like previous Godzilla movies, so I'm not an expert by any means of Godzilla. Obviously, I know about Mothra and some of the other monsters, Mechagodzilla, you know, just the ones that kind of show up in pop culture, Kaiju just in general. I'm I've seen like maybe I don't know what other like 40 or 50 Godzilla movies. I think I've maybe seen this is the. 33rd oh okay ish less than toho i would have expected one. not oh okay but that doesn't count the american ones. that's just the toho ones i've seen maybe a total of like seven godzilla movies probably including the last big american one which is the one with aaron taylor johnson and brian cranston and all that i saw that in the theater but i don't have a big extended history i mean i would say the one that i remember the most prior to that one that i just mentioned was like son of godzilla which is what, like oh, God, 70s? Yeah, like early 70s or something. Yeah, I so my dad was the dad who, like I said, he went to a garage sale and they had like a big box of Godzilla tapes all with the handwritten labels. So they were recorded off of, you know, whatever. And I'm sure he paid all of like a dollar for, you know, a bunch of tapes. And that's kind of how I discovered Godzilla. Um, I do, I would not call myself an expert. I've probably seen somewhere in the ballpark of like 15 of them including the American ones. I, I tend to like the more cheesy, like late 70s, early 80s ones, like uh, Godzilla vs. Smog Monster is pretty good because there's a lot of Japanese hippies that like, you know, here comes Godzilla like smashing up shit and they start doing dances and like Andy Warhol dances and shit in the middle of like Tokyo. Movies it's need a more bizarre. Japanese hippies. Just wanted to put that on the record. Absolutely. I never got the chance to see the last Toho release, which was Shin Godzilla, which I've heard mix things on i've heard it's very good but very slow which is weird kind of but so i know the reason why they toho hasn't made one since shin godzilla is they had a licensing agreement with legendary is that who's doing the american ones yeah that sounds familiar yeah they had a licensing. basically they said okay you do your thing we're gonna take a break from them until i think it was 2020 was the year that that wore off and then you know, they got this a couple years later. So I, I do consider myself a Godzilla fan, but like, I'm not going to act like I'm overburdened by the lore of Godzilla. Like at the end of the day, most of these movies, I just want to see, I mean, frankly, I want to see the guy in the rubber suit kick over a miniature city. And like, I like the ridiculousness of not the story of Godzilla, but the presentation of Godzilla from the old movies. You want to see a guy in a rubber suit kick over some shit. Yeah, I find that entertaining. <laughs> 
have a fit in a suit. Spoiler, there is no rubber suit in that. That's probably the biggest gripe I'll have about this, but it's not a real gripe. It's just a anytime that I see a modern Godzilla movie and there's not a guy in a rubber suit, which I think the last time that was was maybe Godzilla 2000, maybe. I, I'm a little disappointed. I want a guy in a rubber suit. And at the end of the day, don't we all want a guy in a rubber suit just as part of our lives? Is that too much to ask? I don't think it is. So with that in mind, what did you uh, like about God- So, Oh, yeah. Here's your spoiler warning again. So this is where we're going <laughs> to talk about the actual movie. Spoiler. This movie does have a very different vibe from the vast majority of Godzilla films. I guess we'll start with positives on it because that's kind of what we do how what did you like about this movie just as a broad over i think that the movie can be really summed up in two words and i like these two words and i like where the movie went but the two words that i would use to sum up rubber suit i would no i was gonna say i wish but i i do like the way it's presented in this movie i think the two words that i would use to describe this if someone was like describe this movie in two words survivor's guilt basically yes yeah shikishima he's like like we mentioned in the plot or the storyline or whatever it's called, he's a kamikaze pilot. He decides that he, he's going to, pre- he's pretending like his plane has trouble and he lands on this remote Odo Island and the engineers are checking out his plane and they're like, Hey man, we checked everything out, but it looks like it's good to go. Like we can't find anything wrong with it. And he's like, just kind of really struggling with himself to, if he wants to do this or not, you know, if he wants to fly off and crash into something and kill it while killing himself. We should should backtrack just a bit. This takes place right at the tail end of, of World, War, World II. War II, which I think that was in the plot. But that if that's not in there, it's the whole survivor's know. guilt. Yeah, the yeah. whole survivor's guilt just feels like a movie with Godzilla and a bunch of people who are mad that this guy didn't kill himself. Yeah, pretty much like he, it's it's dishonorable for him not to carry out these orders because. That's what he was ordered to do. And anyways, he's on this he's on this island. He's not going to take off. He's going to take off the next day or whatever. And as they're kind of, I don't know, shooting the shit or whatever, Godzilla, little Godzilla, a little Godzilla, not like a little Godzilla, like a baby. But well, he's probably a a baby, but little Godzilla, as in like a three story Godzilla comes on this island and tears shit up. And Shikishima doesn't do what he can do to prevent all these guys from dying and he gets knocked out and he wakes up the next day and the only other surviving person is the head mechanic who is dragging all the bodies to be i don't know if he's going to burn them or mass grave them or just leaving them out or he's collecting all the bodies essentially and they get taken back to the mainland and you know fun all that fun stuff occurs and he just that's when like japan because it's the end of world war ii japan's just decimated like towns are torn up they're just like rubble like villages have been burned and sacked and decimated and his parents were killed and all the shit that went down and his neighbor is like the only one that survives and he he meets this girl in a marketplace who has a baby we find out it's not her baby and basically they just invade his fucking personal space he doesn't adopt him or anything he doesn't adopt the kid or anything and the whole movie is just this beat down on this poor guy you know like he's he feels so guilty that he didn't do what he was supposed to do but at the same time he wants to live like he didn't want to die. So he feels kind of justified. But everybody else is like, you're such a fucking coward. Like, why didn't you just kill yourself? Why didn't you just do what you're supposed to do? And not that anybody would be any better off if he had done this. But I like that the story is, I mean, Godzilla, for all intents and purposes, is just like a plot device. And I l- really like that about the movie is that it's this you don't go into a Godzilla movie, or at least I generally don't go into a Godzilla movie expecting to see a human story. I expect to go into a Godzilla movie and Godzilla, like we said, is going to be throwing a fit and he's going to be stomping on shit all over the place. And that's amazing. That's cool. And this movie has that. <laughs> but it's also got this really human story that's pretty fucking touching. I mean, for for all all, you know, all things previously said. It's funny because I agree with everything you just said about the human side of the story. But at the same time, that's kind of my biggest mixed bag about this movie. And I'll come back around to that in more detail later but for me the biggest things i like about this movie which is probably no surprise they all really revolve around godzilla in different ways minus the mini by godzilla standards godzilla like i thought that looked a little too t-rexy for like me like the opening scene and i saw a couple reviews where people were kind of shitting on them like yeah but like give the movie 10 minutes and it, it fixes that it's clearly telling you a narrative here but once you see you know big g in his like full form he looks 
as good as he's ever looked without being in a rubber suit. Like he's got so many little details that are just very well done on this character. The way that he moves, the way that I've always laughed because there's, I think it was 2014 is the one, the first one with kick ass in it or whatever. I always thought Godzilla was funny looking in that movie because he's like thick with like four C's. And by the end of the movie, he just like passes out and takes a nap on Candlestick Park before waking up and, you know, shaking it off and going back to the ocean. But this one, he, I I don't want to say he looks period correct because that's just fucking ridiculous, but he looks. Like, for what this movie is trying to present, he looks like a fucking menace. He looks great in this. And I like that there's not the cheapening of what Godzilla is in this movie in that he's not fighting another monster, whether that's a good-looking monster or a bullshit monster or a smog monster because hippies like weed or whatever. A garbage bag. Yeah, that too. It's none of that. He's not fighting another monster, and he's not like the savior of Japan. He is straight up a monster that really doesn't seem to have any real purpose in this movie other than to fuck things up. There's a scene that's early-ish. This is a a two hour and I think it's 15 minute movie or something around that that time frame. I want to say it's like within the first half hour, Chikishima gets a job and it's on this boat and well, it's a pair of boats, but he's on this specific boat and it what they're doing is they're cutting the mines that are underwater to detonate these different mines so that they can kind of clear the water around Japan and, you know, let aid come in and all the shit go on. Right. So this is like his government job. He's being paid by the government. And there is a scene where they've collected a couple of these bombs, these mines. Godzilla's already been known. Like they know that he's going to come. I think he's already come once and he's going to, they were expecting that he's going to come back or that other, like he's Godzilla has taken out all these different boats, like destroyers and shit, big battleships. And the scene, and those scenes are amazing, by yeah, the way. Yeah. That's all the destruction is really good. But this specific scene where they are hauling these mines back and Godzilla's like his just his like snout and the top of half of his body. We're not even the top half, but just the sliver of his body is above the water. And he's like almost like serpentine. Yeah, he's like a snake and he is chasing them. And just the way that the eyes look above the surface of the water, the way that he moves, it's so menacing. It's almost terrifying. Mm -hmm. Like, you know. The movie's 40 minutes in. There's still an hour and 20 some odd minutes to go. But it's like, this could be the final confrontation. This thing looks so terrifying. You know, it's not a real thing. Obviously not a Godzilla isn't real. Spoiler. But it just puts this like feeling of tension and terror into that specific scene. You're like, what is going to happen here? And I I really like that about about the design of Godzilla and how he's treated as this like plot device to just be this menace, this like terrifying thing. Godzilla isn't real but the man in the rubber suit is. That's right. Yeah, and there's a lot, any of the action sequences with Godzilla, like, I I mean, you kind of hit the nail on the head as far as what this movie is about. And that is a, you're absolutely right in the sense that it is extremely rare that I go into a, a Godzilla movie and they even make an attempt to make me give a shit about the human characters. Because I think this movie, most of these films know what they are. They know, yeah, there's a story here, but really we're we're going to have several humans that are the like, oh no, how do we stop Godzilla? And then Godzilla comes and kicks him in the face. And then there's maybe two or three others that show up. They're like, well, how about we try this bomb or this gun or call Mothra, whatever. Yeah. <laughs> You know, send the SOS text. And it's very, very much so a formula that has worked for this franchise for what, fucking 60 years, 70 years at this point? Yeah, long time. 50 is the first one came out, something like that. There's a tried and true formula. And basically, as long that I think Toho especially knows, as long as they have a, a lizard thing fucking shit up, they're going to have an audience. The fact that they took the time to put that human element in there does make a huge difference with this movie. And maybe, I don't know if you felt this or not. For me, there was a little bit of a double-edged sword with that because there are points in the movie where it feels like it drags a little bit. You mentioned this is a it's two hour and four minutes as I look over and see. So it's a little bit over two hours. There are a couple points in this movie, mostly in the second half of the movie, where I kind of felt like, all right, let's... I don't want to say let's move this shit along because they're telling you a story that's actually worth telling. But at the same time, in the back of my head, I was like, I haven't seen Godzilla in like 15 minutes in this Godzilla movie. Where what what's he doing? Like, is he plugged in? Like, does he need a new battery or something? Like, and that might have just spoke to my mood at the time of watching it because maybe I just, you know, 
Sometimes when you go into a movie expecting a Godzilla movie and then an actual story breaks out, that can kind of throw you off. Yeah. And I'm not trying to say the story is bad because it's not. It's a very well told, very good story. At the same time, I kind of showed up for Godzilla and your, you know, survivor's guilt, like this guy's really bad at killing himself story is getting in the way of my Godzilla. Yeah, and I can get that. I know a lot of a lot of people probably went that have seen this, went to see it because that's exactly what they're expecting to see. You know, they're expecting to see Godzilla fuck shit up. And the story is always secondary to all that kind of stuff. So I I can definitely see the point of somebody or see the the perspective of someone going in to watch this. And really, this is what I got and being really disappointed with with that whole story. Was there anything that you find out didn't like in the movie? I don't think there was anything that I was really super negative about. I mean, I thought I kind of went into it with no preconceived notion of what the movie would be about. I had heard some things basically saying things like this was a good movie, but not anything saying like, oh yeah, Godzilla's in this thing for like maybe 20 minutes out of the two hours and he fucks some shit up and that's pretty cool. But it's more about this pilot guy and, you know, his regrets. I think he's and... a little more than that, but... You think so? I guess he is in it quite a bit. I bet he's probably got about 40 minutes of the two hours of screen time, roughly. Yeah, I don't have any major negatives like that. I do really love that they took this back to it, like the time frame of it. I, I go to bring up negatives. I'm like, <laughs> but I like this. It kind of speaks to this movie, though. Like it's even as someone who went into this wanting the chaos of Godzilla and getting a heartfelt, like deep story, which could be a bummer, but whatever. Godzilla fixes most bummers. It's hard to really call it too much of a negative because even at the points where I was a little bit like looking at the watch or a little bit like, come on, let's move this shit along. I was so like, like, this is a good story. It's just not quite what I what I was looking for right this moment. And I have a feeling that if I went back and watched this, which I haven't done yet, because I do want to go back and watch it in black and white, just because since watching it the first time, I've watched a couple clips of it in black and white, and it doesn't look like they just threw a filter on. It looks like they actually took the time to go through and make it look good in black and white from start to finish. So I do want to go back and do that. But I think if I went back to it, whether it's in black and white or color, knowing what I'm getting myself into, I might be more prepared for like, okay, you're going to watch this story and Godzilla happens to show up and kind of fuck things up along the way. I was wondering if you had watched the black and white one yet or if you had gone back and watched it. I wasn't sure which which version you had watched. And I just felt like for the first time watching, it, I should probably watch the regular color version just to get a good idea, not. Not that the black and white would be distracting, but you're already reading because the whole movie is pretty much subtitled. I mean, there's not there's a few like maybe a handful of English words and they're from like broadcasts in English of the radio or whatever. Ten of them are Godzilla. So right, (laughs) very limited English uh, range there. But yeah. So do you want like what did you think about watching something fully subtitled or do you watch subtitled stuff often or no issue? I don't do it often, but I don't have an issue with it either. Yeah, same here. It's just. It's another added level of complexity to, I feel like I've watched, I try to read everything as fast as possible so then I can watch like what's actually going on on screen. And not that that's a bad thing. I I will say the benefit to subtitles, surprisingly, is it does kind of make it better on the second watch because you don't have to pay as close attention to what's being said. And my intention when we decided to do this, which I think was Friday, Friday or Saturday, whatever day, my intention was to watch it in color one day and then black and white the next day. And spoiler, alcohol decided I was going to do something else, <laughs> as you do. But I'm I'm actually quite looking forward to going back and watching this a second time, knowing what kind of mo- more of what kind of movie this. I mean, I say knowing what kind of movie this is like, well, it's a Godzilla movie, like it's got Godzilla. I feel like that's going to sell itself. But knowing that there's more of a story to it. I'm kind of looking forward to going back to him like, okay, I'm kind of in the mood for this now with like a little hint of like, let's go fuck up Japan because that's what Godzilla does. Yeah. (laughs) You know, I think it will play better the second time and not having to not necessarily ignore the subtitles, but not having to read them. as It's not like I'm fluent in Japanese now because I watched this subtitled movie, but I feel like I have enough of the storyline that if I miss like a screen or two, I don't feel like I need to backtrack and be like, what the fuck just happened? Right. What did he say? Right. And I thought for this being a a movie that most people would go in, you know, expecting to be just low on story, big on destruction, the ensemble cast, well, not ensemble, but like the main cast that we're pretty much with the entire movie is the, I I would consider the main kind of characters are the guys on the ship, right? 
Shikishima and the three other dudes that manned the, the boat, I thought it was actually like not being, being, reading, reading it, I guess, reading a subtitles. It actually, they had a lot of humor. So it kind of made you feel like, like the captain that, that captains the boat. He reminded me a lot of Quint from Jaws. Like for some reason, yes. just some of the shit that he was saying, the way that he acted, his kind of surly attitude. It's like, oh, okay. I can see parallels to characters from other movies that I like. There's actually a lot of, similarities to jaws in this movie maybe that's because so much of godzilla in this movie is in the water yeah but i feel like there's a lot of similar vibes like you don't see the monster a ton but when you do it's very satisfying yeah when he pops up yeah speaking of very satisfying and if you've watched godzilla like this is maybe heavy spoiler warning so maybe skip ahead like a minute but holy shit his like bad breath has never looked so fucking amazing as it does in this movie. Yeah, it's a really cool weapon. Well, just the whole effect, like the the way they light his spine up, just kind of, you know, pokey thing by pokey thing. Yeah, like charging it and up. And then, yeah, and just seeing, like, this looks like it's dropping an atom bomb out of his face. Like, it's so well done that even as someone who's been watching Godzilla movies off and on since he was a kid, seeing it this time, I don't do this a lot in movies. I actually went back and watched that scene again. I'm like, holy shit, that looked really fucking cool. <laughs> like, that's kind of the advantage of watching something at home is when something happens, you can go back and be like, I got to see that again, <laughs> like right now. I was really impressed with that. And frankly, the visual effects in this, no rubber suit aside, this is like a $15 million movie. This movie looks so good for a $15. $15. You're saying the budget on this million was $15 million. Million? It's like $15 million, yeah. No way. So, yeah, this, uh, we'll see if it's actually listed on here, but I've seen that quite a few times. It's, you're right. It says estimated budget 15 million on IMDb. Yeah. This is, so we talked about the Terminator last week. The Terminator in 1984's budget in 1984 dollars was like 8 million or 6 million or something like that. That would blow these dollars out of the water. So, just for a comparison. Yeah. Just one comparison. The Avengers Infinity War movie was 316 million dollars compared to this which movie let's just take all the like people and all the like acting all that shit just the effects which movie do you like better that's tough i haven't seen avengers in a while so i i kind of say for me i prefer this but this doesn't again you're seeing a giant lizard creature with radiation and spikes and shit fuck up a town so it's it doesn't look real but this movie does a really good job of making Godzilla look like he is actually part of and interacting with the scenery as opposed to the scenery working around Godzilla because that's how they animate. Yeah, and I, I do want to add, I think watching it, I, I couldn't tell how much of like the backgrounds and things were green screen and how much was actually like a real set. And that's not a that's not a plus or a minus. Well, maybe it's a plus. I don't know. It sounds like a plus to me. I mean, how well it looked. And it's supposed to be era appropriate. You know, there's nobody driving around in like a Tesla or anything in the background. You didn't see anything like that. Right. Anything that was like a vehicle or ships or planes are all era appropriate. So it's it's really tough. I mean, it looks so much of it looks even the stuff on the sea. I'm sure they didn't have like big destroyers and shit just floating around like, hey, cool. Let's just borrow this uh World War II era battleship and, you know, tool around in a pond out somewhere. It was like, this has to be CG or has to be, you know, green screened and whatnot. And it looks really convincing. I mean, it looks like, again, era appropriate. And that's why I feel like also watching it in black and white, it might be more like you might get more of a vibe, you know, as to the time frame of when it happens, because that's obviously what movies were filmed in back then. Any other scenes that you want to highlight before we start kind of wrapping on this one? No, there's a little thing that happens at the end, the way that the movie kind of the last action scene. I don't really want to get into, but I was. Oh, yeah. I don't want to spoil that, but I'm not thrilled about how something ends in this, but I don't want to. Not thrilled. We'll just say that I had questions on the scale of Godzilla versus some other things that were happening. I don't know if yours is the same kind of thing, but I have a, a feeling it may actually deal with the very end of the movie. But such is life. I will say one of the best scenes in any Godzilla movie that I've ever seen is in this movie. And it is the news crew that is on the roof when Godzilla is doing (laughs) Godzilla things. Yeah, that's great. It's such a welcome, like, breath of comedy, like unintentional. Maybe it's intentional, but it's just fucking perfect. And it almost is more of a like commentary on how media would cover something like this today than how they probably would have in 19 whatever, 19. 
probably 45 or whatever. or 40, yeah. Yeah. Around that time. Right. It's probably more of a commentary on today, but it plays out just fucking comically brilliant. But yeah, I don't want to ruin the ending on this. I have a gripe with that. So if you know what I'm talking about, you can message me somewhere where people who haven't seen this can't see it and we'll we'll talk about it. But that doesn't matter. Let's get into what time is it, Sean? Then you're in for a big treat, bro, because it's hot dog time. Why don't you kick us off this week? All right, I'll kick us off with a tasty beat. To me, the movie as a whole is about, like I mentioned, survivor's guilt and redemption. It's about a man who feels responsible for a lot of people dying. And, um, you know, he really just ignores the people around him that want to help him because he's dealing with his own personal shit. He, he's dealing with letting everybody down in some way or another. And I got to admit, like watching this, I did not think I would get emotional watching a Godzilla. A Godzilla movie of all things, but you know, I had some feelings by the time the whole thing was over. This guy basically gets shit on the entire movie and he finally gets his comeuppance. I won't spoil how, how that happens or what happens, but I think it's really interesting because this whole human story is wrapped up in a Godzilla movie. Godzilla is the big bad guy, but he doesn't really do anything with malicious intent. It's not like he's dead set on destroying Japan. It's just what he does it's what godzilla does i mean it's no no real big surprise but i was surprised that it wasn't what i expected going in watching this movie i didn't expect to see a human story behind a godzilla movie that was getting so much like you know so much hurrah or so much praise about it i gotta say godzilla minus one is eight blue heat rays out of 11 hot dogs for moi so i didn't really have any expectations going into this either i don't didn't watch trailers. All I saw was it's a Godzilla movie. I was already sold. Again, there's been 30 some out of these. If you don't know if you want to see Godzilla by this point, I don't think a trailer is going to make a difference. But this is, in my opinion, it's definitely got an argument to be the best overall film of the entire franchise from a storytelling perspective, from a visual perspective, the effects, the gravity of what Godzilla brings to it. It's got a lot going for it. I'm not going to go as far to say it's my favorite, and most of that really has more to do with nostalgia vibes than anything. Like, you're never going to replace the vibe I got from watching Godzilla vs. Spog Monster or Godzilla vs. King Kong, where they lift him on a bunch of balloons and he looks like a fucking dipshit floating through Japan. You know, all that type of stuff. It doesn't have that, but what it does have is, I mean, this is movie is really a masterclass in filmmaking on a budget. It does just about everything right. And the things that I don't like about it are really more about me than what this film does. My only things I would say there are minor gripes is there are a couple points in the movie where, you know, to quote Homer, when whenever Godzilla is not on screen, all the other characters should be saying, where's Godzilla? Somewhere to his Poochie comment. So it has a little bit of that. But when you do get Godzilla in this movie, he is so well done or it. I don't know. They never really gave Godzilla a gender. So I'm going to. But it's always been he. But. When you do get Godzilla in this movie, it is so well done and so entertaining that it covers everything else. And I've sat through a lot of really bad Godzilla movies just for the five minutes of like Godzilla carnage that makes it worthwhile. This movie delivers on it tenfold. Hot dog wise, I'd probably give this like seven and a half misplaced news crews out of ten radiated hot dogs. It's great. I don't find myself wanting to go back to watch Godzilla movies every day. Like I probably watch one or two a year at this point, and that's of the whole catalog, whichever one it happens to be on that day. I'll watch this again. Again, I want to go back and you know watch the black and white one. But after I get through the black and white one, probably in the next couple of weeks, I can't really imagine myself watching this for a while. But when I do get back to it, I, I think it's gonna be it's gonna be like a hot fart in the wind, just a breath of fresh air that's willing to be absorbed. Mm. Yeah, meaty. Beefy. So, full of protein. This week, our question of the week was pretty straight and to the point, and we included a picture of Shawshank Redemption to really throw everyone off, because that worked. The question was pretty simple, is what is your favorite movie monster? Not necessarily monster movie, but your favorite movie monster. We're going to start over on Facebook, and our good friend John, who is not me, said, Godzilla, just a bunch of good childhood memories of a big lizard doing smashy smashy. Totally agree. We will skip over to Instagram because it looks like there's. I'm going to have to reload the other site. So on Instagram, starting with Old Dirty Bastard, who is one of the members of the Krusty Boys, said the Xenomorph has always been my favorite. Acid for what? Scott over at the You Run podcast simply says Gremlins. Go with a much smaller approach. I appreciate that. And then 
Bozzy2909 said Jaws. And keeping up on Instagram, we also had Sam from the Creature Features DTF who said Bruce. So he's doubling down on Jaws. Good choice. And Quad Pro Quopod says, always been partial to the Graboids and Tremors, but the thing is up there as well. I love both of those movies, so I really can't argue with either one of those. Man, that's um, a good answer so far. We're just getting started. Over to Twitter. Our friends over at Better on Draft, they're at Better on Draft, said Howard Howe. And I asked him, not Mr. Tusk, and he just stopped responding. So I guess he's going to stick with Howard Howe. So if you haven't seen Tusk, don't, but Howard Howe is apparently a monster. Late and Confused said Dracula. He's one of the most, definitely one of the most well known and feared vampires that there is. I really like this selection because there's been so many like iterations at Dracula, so many different portrayals of him. She chose Bella Lugosi, the classic. Oh, was he the? No, he wasn't. It was no, well, he wasn't Dracula. He was just a vampire. But anyway, talking myself out like an idiot. Bella Lugosi is dead. I would have gone with Nick Cage Dracula, but Bella's good too. Our friends over at Dissect That Film said Godzilla, and they used a clip of Godzilla from this movie, so that's a good option. Over at Pop Culture Reflections Podcast, another member of the URN Podcast Network said, damn, this is tough. Can I pick Tarman? Does he qualify? I said, yes, he ab- you absolutely can pick Tarman, and he said, okay, I'm picking Tarman because he is 100% my favorite. Boomer at the aforementioned Podcast in the Woods has said, I'll have to go with the monsters from my very first horror film critters and if it weren't for critters we wouldn't have one of the best 80s power ballads ever put to film power of the night at walrus 90 who is weird walter says pennywise the clown is that a monster sure yeah with that why not clown yeah our friend pearl who's at hissy face x says obviously the pendulum from mystics in bally she's basically a flying vampire head with her internal organs dangling from her neck there's a gif included if you want to go search this out and it basically looks like a mannequin head with a large lobster dangling from under it it's very i'm assuming this is italian dr snakes who is at dr snakes says henry from henry uh portrait of serial killer it's been so long since i watched that movie but he's certainly a shitty human being in that and then warren badinsky says going back through the hellraiser marathon so i'm gonna say pinhead as either bradley's original or clayton's recent take on it so that's all we got on social media. Sean, who is your favorite movie monster? That's a really tough question. I like that we put this out and it's kind of open-ended, so it's not necessarily, you know, one specific thing. So it was good to hear everybody's answers. For me, I think of Godzilla. I think of Dracula. I think of all the stuff that people listed, but some other people kind of hit it. from Like the classic, I don't know how classic it is, but for me, like the classic monster is the Xenomorph. That's one that would always terrify. It's just, it can be anywhere. It acid for blood, you know, it, it, it puts shit in your fucking stomach and it erupts out and all that. That's just, I don't like it. So I would, I would answer Xenomorph. <laughs> I don't like it. It's my favorite. Yeah. How about you? So my answer hasn't been said yet. And it's been a while since we've talked about this movie at all. And we'll still eventually do an episode about it, but I'm going with Fluffy from Creep Show. I love Creep Show. I love Tom Sweeney. I love this monster. I love their roles, the story in this movie. So that that's my answer is the crate monster from the basement of a school or something. Yeah, like a university or something, right? Yeah, something like that. Tom Savini getting his first chance to make a real big movie monster. And I think he he crushed it and it looks good. And yeah, I lo- I like that monster. If only there's some other entity that might want, you know what, fuck them. Anyway, if you want to tell us to watch other movies, whether it's Shawshank Redemption or anything else, we'll take suggestions. You can reach us at all kinds of places. We're at crap.town. You can send us messages on there. We're on all the social media networks. We are at Dewey Pod Monster. If you search us, you're going to find us. And we're also members of the You Run Podcast Network, so you can find our old episodes at yourunpodcast.com. I don't know if there's a messaging option on there, but if there is, you can yell at Scott about it, and I bet you he'll tell me, like, hey, some asshole is yelling at you through me. So he'll he'll get the message to us if that's even available. I don't know. Sean Wells is going on. I don't know. If you want to answer the question of the week, <laughs> you can answer it on social media. You can find us at Dewey Pod Monster. I think John already mentioned that. If you want to, I don't know, maybe click on some of the polls that we talk about, that we post on these episodes, you can do that on our, I think it's on Spotify. You can do that. You can answer questions of the week there, too, I guess, I don't, if you want to. That's cool. 
Uh, if you want to follow my craft beer adventures, you can find me at youtube.drafttherapy.com. You can also find me on social media at Draft Therapy. Click on all the stuff on the show links in the notes because that'll take you to stuff and maybe we can get a buck. I like money. So, yeah. That's it. That's all we got. You lose. You're done. God damn. It's going to live forever, isn't it? You lose, American asshole. Yes. Yes.